you're mic'd and we're ready I to am go. Mic. Ready to go. You're start to tell story. Okay, you're going to come back. Okay, we'll take a couple seconds then. Um, okay. Evan Weiner uh, look at this. is a yeah. sports columnist. Uh, he can speak on a wide variety of different uh, topics. I'm actually going to pass around a book, uh, and you can take a quick look through it as uh, as we're listening. Uh, but just take a quick look. But this is a a book that's going to come out as an e-book in uh, June, January, and uh, it's going to be a, a and what what this is. This is called the Business and Politics of Sports, and it's a selection of his columns. He's been a very prolific writer on a number of topics related to sports and sports business, um, and uh, continues to. Uh, and once I actually, this has been really good for me because once uh, we made contact uh, several months ago through Kid Chrissy, uh, who works over in ELS and is a big baseball guy. Um, I've been on his email list, so I get three, about three columns a week, which keeps me up to date on everything that's going on. But anyway, uh, this is going to go in ebook form, so it'll be able to be updated on a every couple of month basis, and that'll uh, keep it a little more fresh. Let me just uh, give you a little bit of background about Evan. Uh, actually, there's a cool website, it's, uh, which I just really went on for the first time to get this bio, but it's mcnsports.com. And uh, maybe you could actually. I'll explain a little bit about, about because I'll be. I'll incorporate two minutes about it in the speech because we're talking about technology, media, and sports. So exactly. where it's going. So, uh, so Evan Weiner is a television and radio commentator, a columnist, and author, as well as a college lecturer. In fact, he lectured last night. Where were you again last night? Sacred Heart University outside of New Haven last night. He's a columnist yeah. with the New York Sun, with the business of uh, sport, and contributes a weekly column off the wall to NHL.com. Contributing columnist for New York Newsday, AM New York, New York Press, uh, The Bergen uh, Record, Philadelphia Metro, Washington Examiner, Orlando Sentinel, Rhode Island Sports Journal, and Chicago Tri Tribune's uh, Spanish Hawaii newspapers in New York, Chicago, LA. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but there's a long background of uh, <coughs> different things and accomplishments that, that Evan has been involved in. Uh, in 2007, he spoke at the George Bush Presidential Library in College Station, Texas, uh, before a group of three Russians, three Nigerians, three Indonesians, three Turks, three Venezuelans, and five Americans. It was a State Department initiative. I was cool with the State Department. They sent me in to, to brand American sports and government, basically. And I, I was, that thing, um, basically, uh, what the government was trying to do under the Bush administration, and if you notice the countries there, Russia, Turkey, Venezuela, and Nigeria, and Indonesia are not exactly friendly to the United States, and they wanted me to explain how government and sports go hand in hand in the United States and make friends. And I have made friends with one Nigerian. The Russians don't talk to me. I don't know why. <laughs> and the Indonesians didn't. So you, now you haven't interviewed Prokhorov? No, no, not yet. But uh, I, I know quite a few of the Russians. People. He, uh, he's actually been an NHL announcer for the Minnesota North Stars. He's on a number of other things. And he's a frequent lecturer at college and university. So uh, since we're in sports media right now, I mean, he, Evan could have talked about any one of a number of topics. If he came in in September, he would have talked about leagues. If he came in in October, he would have talked about franchises. Uh, but we're doing media now, so he's going to tell us a little bit about the background of sports media, uh, where we are now, and where we're going perfect because that's what we're talking about in class. So without further ado, Evan Weiner. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to look at the camera. Yeah, I think you're supposed to look at the camera. Uh, I'm going to give you a very quick synopsis how I got into the business area of sports and how I became this quote unquote global expert. Um, I was unemployed in 1981 at the age of 25 and uh, somebody needed somebody to go cover baseball strike talks which was right up my alley because I was covering politics at the time. In 1980, uh, I was on the presidential campaigns of Ronald Reagan and Ted Kennedy. And all of a sudden, I'm doing this baseball stuff, the baseball strike stuff, and uh, it dawned on me. The same people who were behind Kennedy and Reagan were the same people behind sports. And in 82, I ended up covering the National Football League strike in 1984. 384, the NBA came up with a new collective bargaining agreement, which basically introduced salary cap, drug testing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the real crowning achievement of my education was in 1986. And now none of you are going to have the opportunity to get this kind of education. I kind of just lucked into it. 
Uh, I ended up covering the United States Football League, National Football League antitrust trial, which lasted about three months. And I got to meet everybody who is connected with the business end. And then in 1987, there was another football strike. And in 1986, the government under Ronald Reagan and the, both houses of Congress passed the 1986 Tax Act, which reinvented stadium funding and how stadiums were funded by municipalities. That's another time, another speech, because that could last an hour, hour and a half, and you would still have so many questions, but 1986 is kind of the dividing period between the age of today's modern sports and business and what came before it. But what came before it is important to know if you're going into the sports business in terms of the media. Um, sports business was basically newspapers, and basically it was newspaper reporters talking about games that were played. And if you ever get the old microfilms of the 1920s, there's incredible poetry to sports writers and prose. Um, the, I'm sh I don't know if you ever heard of the Four Horsemen of Notre Dame or the Galloping Ghost, Red Grange. I know you guys in the back have heard about these people, but they probably haven't. These were the heroes of the 1920s. Babe Ruth was the hero of the 1920s. Not many people ever really did see <coughs> Babe Ruth play baseball because there was no TV. There was no internet. Babe Ruth played pretty much in a vacuum. Uh, people spoke about him. It went from word of mouth. This Babe Ruth, did you see, hit another home run. Babe Ruth also came into baseball in 1920 when something was just invented that would revolutionize baseball. However, the baseball owners had no idea what to do with it. It was called radio. Um, now, radio, TV, internet, cable TV is a commonplace thing. Everybody uses it. But in 1920, when KDKA in Pittsburgh did the first Pittsburgh Pirates game, nobody knew exactly what to do with radio. It was a new toy on the market. NBC radio basically sprung out of a guy by the name of Sarnoff, who ran NBC until the 1960s and becomes very important in this speech. Uh, Bob Sarnoff, Robert Sarnoff, was the guy who connected the world to the sinking of the Titanic. He was working on the telegraph in 1912 when the Titanic sunk, and he got the word out that the Titanic was sinking. Sarnoff, if you look up his biography, is a rather interesting character. Because of the sinking of the Titanic, he ended up putting together NBC radio because he understood how quickly word could travel with technology. Baseball owners didn't realize that. KDKA did the Pirates games, and between, say, 1920 and 1935, baseball owners allowed anybody who owned a radio station license, if they wanted to come into the ballpark, they could do the games. Okay, so baseball gets sold over radio, except there's a problem with selling over the radio. Baseball owners were going through the Depression in the 1930s, and the attendance dropped because of the depression. But they kind of blamed the radio. We're giving our product away for nothing. And radio was not good for us. It was not good in building brands. But in the 1930s, sports never did build brands. There were no brands in sports. I mean, the New York Yankees were the New York Yankees. But if you ever look at Babe Ruth's jersey in the 1920s, particularly the early 1920s, do you notice there's something missing on the Yankee uniform? Anyone know what that is? They had pinstripes, but they didn't have the Yankee insignia. And one of the things that um, has only come into being, into place in the last 25 years in sports is, what is the most important thing that a team or a league sells? Logo. 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 Teams come and go, players come and go, but the logo, the Yankee logo, has stayed pretty much the same over the years. The Cubs logo, Red Sox logo, the logo is the most important thing to protect. But back in the 1920s and 30s, when this new technology that they didn't know very much about, radio, the owners didn't know what to do with it. They thought, well, it's keeping people away. Instead of expanding the baseball base, they thought it was shrinking it actually expanded the baseball base. More people became interested because they were able to hear what was going on on a daily basis with baseball. And subsequently what happens after that is that all of a sudden baseball owners get smart. 
but it takes football owners to get smart as well. Uh, in 1934, the annual Thanksgiving game that is now played in Detroit starts in Detroit because the Detroit Lions football team was looking to pick up people that came off the parade to go to Briggs Stadium to watch their football games. However, when they announced that Thanksgiving game that year, they also sold that Thanksgiving game to Mutual Radio. They sold the rights to it. And baseball owners said, hey, wait, we don't need six, seven, eight different radio stations in here. We only, could, we only should have one radio station. And guess what? We could sell the rights to the games to one radio station and make some money off of it. And that's what they did. So all of a sudden, they become, they realize that if you have an announcer, and uh, it's not like this in today's media, although Harry Callis was one of the last people who was really identified with a baseball team. But back in the 1930s and 1940s, Mel Allen was identified with the New York Yankees, uh, Russ Hodges with the New York Giants, uh, Red Barber with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and uh, By Som here in Philadelphia with both the Phillies and A's. They became the extension between the players and the teams. So radio became an okay thing because you had a nice guy, Jimmy Dudley in Cleveland, Bob Prince in Pittsburgh saying, hey, you know, come see the Buckos play. You know, I'm telling you, I'm a fan too. And these guys became fans of the team and they became your conduit between the team and the player as opposed and the and the audience as opposed to reading it in newspapers. Radio became cool. TV though didn't become cool. Uh, TV starts <laughs> roughly in the 1920s, and by 1939, there's an experimental TV station in New York that does the Brooklyn Dodger games. Uh, they do it at the New York World's Fair in 1939, and uh, TV gets pushed aside because of World War II. But after World War II and people coming back, the veterans coming back, TV starts to proliferate. And some owners, like the New York owners, say, okay, let's put some games on TV. And these TV stations were really looking to get games on TV because they needed to fill up time. And baseball would be a good magnet for people to get in front of the TV. Although Milton Berle in the 1950s is really credited with getting the push that people wanted to watch his show and getting the push for people to buy TV. But what happens in the 1950s with baseball owners, again, and National Football League owners? They do not embrace the technology. And here's one of the reasons why. In 1950, the Los Angeles Rams, and the Los Angeles Rams went to the finals and played the Cleveland Browns in the NFL championship game in 1950. They were getting about 100,000 people per game at the Coliseum. All of a sudden, in 1951, some TV station bought the rights to Los Angeles Rams games and put the home <laughs> games on. What happened to the attendance? Cut in half. And all of a sudden, the NFL comes up with this thing saying, well, you know what? We have to protect our crowd, so we're going to come up with this blackout. Now, the blackout goes through the court system. It's upheld by Judge Grimm through 1960, 61, and the blackout system was actually repealed by, the 19, by 1973, and I'm jumping a little ahead of where I should be because I'm talking about baseball. The baseball owners in the 1950s lived by generating gate revenue. It was not TV driven, it was not radio driven, it was gate driven, sort of like the NHL today. When national TV contracts were signed with NBC, and they were able to sign contracts with NBC, most of that money went to the baseball pension fund. Uh, through the 1960s. And they were playing all-star games for the baseball pension and they were using TV monies for the baseball pension. And a lot of this is interrelated and I could go on and on and I could be here for the next six days explaining how all this is interrelated. So giving you the thumbnail version of all of this. In 1957, Branch Rickey gets fired by the Pittsburgh Pirates. Now, Branch Rickey is the guy who brings Jackie Robinson into organized baseball, as they called it in those days, and he signs him with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he sends him down to Montreal, and Jackie Robinson uh, plays with the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947. Branch Rickey is probably remembered most for that. In fact, if I went around the room, if you knew of Branch Rickey, that's probably the only thing you would think about him. However, Branch Rickey 
is a major, major player in the development of pro football and the Super Bowl as a national holiday. Even though Branch Rickey's last connection to baseball was as the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers football team back in the 1940s. But Branch Rickey, after he's fired by the Pittsburgh Pirates, he has no job. Pirates, uh, not the Pirates, the Dodgers and Giants are moving from New York to California. Branch Rickey decides uh, w with a bunch of others that it's time for a third major league. And they form this thing called the Continental Baseball League, which never gets off the ground. Branch Rickey goes around the country and starts talking to young entrepreneurs or older entrepreneurs about how about investing in what we want is a 12-team Continental Baseball League. We'll build it up and then eventually it will be equal to the American League and National League and they'll accept us, all this other stuff. But a couple of things that he does attracts Lamar Hunt, who's 25 years old in Dallas and has been unsuccessful in getting a National Football League team in Dallas. And it is through Branch Rickey that sports changes. Now, baseball has an antitrust exemption from 1922 on, which means they could sell their 16 teams as one entity to a TV network. No other league could do that. National Football League couldn't do it. National Basketball Association was eight teams that nobody cared about. National Hockey League was six teams, two of them in Canada, two of them tucked in the Northeast, Boston and New York, and two of them in the Midwest in Detroit and Chicago. Certainly not a national game, and they weren't going to get too much TV interest either from the two networks at the time, which were CBS and NBC. But Branch Rickey and his Continental Baseball League prospectus gives a couple of examples of how to have a successful startup league, not mindful of what the antitrust laws are in the country. And what he does is say, we have to share revenues 50-50. And also, this league has to sell its TV rights as one. You can't sell it in 12 separate, 12 separate TV packages. It has to be one. We have to maximize what we have. Lamar Hunt looks at it, 1959, says, I'm kind of interested in this Dallas franchise and this new baseball league, but really I'm concentrating on getting a team in the National Football League. He does not get a team in the National Football League, nor does Bud Adams, who's in Houston. Hunt and Adams meet. They say, let's form a new football league. They form a new football league. And I'm not going to get into the formation of the American Football League and all the things that happened that ultimately made it successful, but I will give you one tenant that made it successful and that changed sports totally in the United States. And this goes to the TV and media end. They adopted Branch Rickey's formula. And the eight American Football League teams decided to sell their product as one to ABC TV. ABC TV back in 1959-1960 was half a network. They had some shows like the Frank Sinatra show and they had the Flintstones. They didn't have wide world of sports at that point. They didn't have the Olympics at that point. They didn't even have major affiliates at that point throughout most of the country. But they were desperate for the programming, which would be every Sunday. Hunt sold the eight teams to ABC. <coughs> the guy who brokered the deal, by the way, and you want to talk about nepotism in sports, the guy who brokered the deal for the AFL in ABC was a guy by the name of Jay Michaels. You know his son, Al Michaels. Al Michaels was born into a sports family. So uh, there's a lot of nepotism in sports that uh, Jack Buck's kid, Joe Buck, is another guy. Kenny Albert, Marv Albert's son. So there's a lot of nepotism in sports. Once you get in the industry, you'll find that it's an extremely small industry where everybody knows everybody. Literally, everybody knows everybody. Players come and go, but the, the business movers are all the same. Anyway, so Hunt sells the AFL package to ABC, and Pete Rozelle is the new commissioner of the NFL, 1960. And the NFL has all kind of little networks. New York Giants Network is one of the biggest. New York Giants Network extends out of New York, north through New York State, and through the six New England states. Philadelphia Eagles are kind of compressed because the Eagles have New Jersey, Pennsylvania, but they can't go south because the Baltimore Colts have Maryland. They can't really go west because the Pittsburgh Steelers 
uh, have um, <coughs> Western Pennsylvania, and the Colts and Steelers also shared the same NBC stations <coughs> in the 1950s that went through Western Pennsylvania, Western Maryland, all the way down to Tennessee. The Washington Redskins had the biggest market in terms of actual coverage areas. They went from Virginia to Florida out to the New Mexico-Texas border and then back up through Missouri. Uh, the West Coast teams, LA had the Southwest, San Francisco had the Northwest. Uh, the Cleveland Browns had a decent market throughout Ohio, but each team was able to cut their own deal and make all their own money, whatever money they made. The Giants, the Bears, and the Rams, New York, Chicago, LA, had the three biggest markets in terms of money. Green Bay Packers had the worst market in terms of money because they only had Wisconsin and there wasn't much TV money in Wisconsin. AFL, they share their TV. NFL can't share their TV because Justice Grimm has been watching them from eight, for about seven, eight years by this point because of the Los Angeles Rams and the blackout rule, and they have to heed to the antitrust rules. Pete Rozelle, in 1961, goes to Congress in, in August of 1961 and goes to Emanuel Seller, who is a Brooklyn congressman who had been there since 1920 and was really one of the deans of the House at that point. And he wants to sell Emanuel Seller on the fact that the NFL should be able to sell all 14 teams in 1961 to the highest bidding network, which would be either CBS or NBC, because those were the only two legitimate TV networks in place in 1961-62. Emanuel Seller, in three days, gets the bill through the House. You saw how long it took the health care issue to get through the House. He gets this bill through the House in three days. And basically, the bill is that antitrust laws do not apply to sports leagues when they want to sell their entity to a network as one. He gets it through the House. It gets through the Senate. John Kennedy signs the legislation on September 30th, 1961. Now, you could go look this up on Wikipedia, wherever you want to look it up. I just wrote a column, and I think you probably remember it, as September 30th, every September 30th, everybody in the NFL should say thank you or send a thank you to Congress for not repealing the 1961 Sports Broadcast Act. Now, how many of you remember two years ago when the Patriots and Giants were playing and the Patriots were going for a perfect season and the brouhaha that Congress had over the fact that that game, the Giants-Patriots game, was only going to be seen on NFL Network? Remember that two years ago? And remember John Kerry was involved? Remember, Arlen Specter was involved, and people would say to me, wait, wait a minute, why is Congress involved in a football game? Congress is involved, in, Congress is involved in a football game because of the 1961 Sports Broadcast Act. Congress created the level playing field for the NFL, for the AFL in those days, the American Football League, although the American Football League was flying under the radar. They didn't have to worry about the National Basket, uh, the uh, Major League Baseball. Coincidentally, the NBA's contract with NBC expired. And, if you, and you want to see how far sports has come. In 1961-62, the National Basketball Association, that was the year Wilt scored 100 points in Hershey, Pennsylvania against the Knicks, had no national TV contract. <coughs> There was the only way you could get basketball games, you probably could get them down here in Philadelphia, you could get some NBA games uh, up in New York on Channel 9, but the NBA barely had any TV presence in 1961-62. 1962-63, the NBA was able to package itself as one and sell its rights to ABC. ABC was <coughs> desperate for programming, and every Sunday, and I remember this as a kid, and you probably remember this in the 60s, the only games you ever saw was Boston playing Philadelphia. Wilt against Bill Russell. That was it. You never saw any other team. NBA was basically a two-team league, even though Los Angeles was out there. Because of the cost of technology in Los Angeles and how you transmitted games in those days, the only time you saw the Lakers was if they were in the championship or a team out in the West. And they were the only team out in the West. There was no team west of St. Louis. So you never saw the Lakers on TV because the cost was too much. But college football was able to uh, fall under the same category. 
NHL, National Hockey League, if they could find somebody who was interested, would also fall in that category. Now, because of TV, let me ask you a question. Six teams in the National Hockey League in those days. Eight teams in the National Basketball Association. Do you think TV becomes a major partner and a major push in the expansion of not only baseball, not only football, but the National Basketball Association, National Hockey League, and the formation of the American Basketball Association, World Football League, World Hockey Association, World Football League? Do you think that how media, because they saw Roselle successful with getting more money by bundling his teams and selling it to the highest bidder, which was CBS, in 1962. And they got more money than they ever thought than you could ever put together on the 14 separate networks. Do you think media has a push behind the expansions of the NBA, NHL, formations of new leagues? Well, we've actually talked in class about okay. what one financial analyst called Gary Bettman's wacky national footprint strategy. And really, the entire expansion of the National Hockey League was designed to get strong TV television. TV bond. And I'll, and I'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> Back, the NBA, the NBA, and I talked to a lot of guys from the 1950s, the NBA of today does not resemble anything of the NBA in the 1950s. NBA in the 1950s was sort of like the National Hockey League. Guys would go out there, get into fistfights. Uh, there's a story when the Boston Celtics, I believe it was in 58 or 59, they played the Cincinnati Royals. And uh, Red Auerbach got into a fight on the bench and was arrested by the Cincinnati Gardens security and turned over to Cincinnati police. And he was in the lockup in Cincinnati. And the Boston Celtic players had to literally pass the hat to bail him out. There were fights every night. You had guys in Syracuse, and I was talking to the late George Yardley and Cliff, uh, not Cliff Hagen, Bob Pettit, where the ladies would used to take hat pins and used to use rubber bands and shoot them at players as they were running up and down the court. It was a rough and tumble league, really rough and tumble, but the players in the 1950s, and this was after the 1958 NFL championship game, which is called the greatest game ever between the Baltimore Colts and the New York Giants. Wasn't the greatest game ever if you talk to people on the winning team, the Baltimore Colts. But it was the greatest game ever because Johnny Unitas led the uh, Colts down the field. It was in overtime. People sat in front of the TV. And remember back in 1958, and I don't know how it was down here in Philadelphia, but in 1958 in New York, you had Channel 2, Channel 4, Channel 5, Channel 7, Channel 9, Channel 11, Channel 13. He had seven stations. The only two stations that were watched by people were Channel 2 and Channel 4, which is CBS and NBC affiliates. So there was very limited things on TV at that point. And this football game captivated people. And all of a sudden, people talked about, hey, did you see this great game, 1958 championship game? And what a great thing that, that Johnny Unitas, he went downfield. And the Giants were the glamour team. They had Frank Gifford. He, had, he was handsome Frank Gifford. They had the big names. They had the ch crowd chanting defense, defense, defense. So it was a marriage between football, between TV, and Madison Avenue. Frank Gifford was a great football player. But Frank Gifford, you probably know of him, not of his football career, but his days as Monday Night Football announcer. But it was the perfect marriage, the perfect storm. It led to the formation of the American Football League. It led to expansion of other sports. And TV is a beast that you have to feed. You have to feed the beast. You have to have programming. And I don't know if you talked about how content is king. Content is king. And all of a sudden, TV looked at it and said, hey, wait a minute. It's cheaper for us to pay rights fees to get a National <laughs> Football League game on Saturday the TV, or Sunday, the TV networks, whether it's CBS or NBC. Remember I talked about Bob Sarnoff? Remember Sarnoff? Sarnoff is the guy who runs NBC TV. He's the guy in the Titanic. He's the guy who's typing up the, he's the guy who's telling the world, using a telegraph, what's going on with the Titanic. He builds this network. First, it's NBC Radio, NBC Red and Blue, and he sells off one of those records, uh, one of those radio networks. And then, he, fought, he has NBC TV. 
He builds the TV network because he's selling RCA products, Radio Corporation of America, which is basically radios and TVs. And if you want to read about Sarnoff, if you're interested in it, Sarnoff is the guy who nearly killed FM radio because he didn't like the guy who invented FM radio and refused to put FM radio into the radios that he was building because he was mad at this guy in New Jersey. So Sarnoff is a major, major, major figure in sports that nobody ever talks about. Pete Rozelle signs his deals with CBS in 1962, 1964. In 1964, CBS and Bill Paley, they're going after the NFL rights, as is Sarnoff. All of a sudden, the American Football League rights become available because the five-year contract with ABC expires. NBC loses the bid for the NFL games to CBS. <laughs> Sarnoff makes a call to his old friend, Sonny Werblin, who's running the New York Jets. He said, uh, by the way, can you find out what CBS is paying the NFL for their five-year contract? He finds out, and it's roughly, in an, it's in the neighborhood of $7 million a year, or some, some, some ridiculously low figure. Sarnoff says, I will match it with the AFL and I will make you the league. All of a sudden, there's more money flowing into the AFL because NBC decides to fund the project. Sonny Werblin <coughs> is the owner of the New York Jets. The big prize in the 1965 draft is Joe Namath. Joe Namath is drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals of the National Football League and the Houston Oilers. But Joe Namath made it quite clear that he wanted to play in one of the major cities, LA or New York. The AFL in those days was very accommodating to players. They said, where do you want to play? We'll sign you to a contract with our league and then you can play wherever you want. And there was a lot of cases like that. In the NFL